Uh, well, I have the pleasure of uh, finishing up, and so I want to take the opportunity to thank David and all of his helpers and the Lee Fraumini, uh, uh, Symposi Lee Fraumini Association uh, for this wonderful, wonderful experience and absolutely spectacular um, job. And I took some names down of all the helpers, so let me just say them. Debbie, Alice, Todd, Holly, Arlene, and Detano, right? And let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and then I, I actually would uh, like to thank the Lee Fraumini Association and the uh, uh, families, the Lee Fraumini families, for being here. It is extremely inspirational for us, the scientists, to have you here, and it makes the meeting very, very special. And I'm sure I speak for all the scientists when I say we're going home and we're going to work harder. <laughs> it's just we've gotten to know the people and we're going to work harder. <laughs> now, actually, last talks at meetings like this take several forms, and I thought I don't want to talk about the past. That would be a review of the past. I don't even want to talk about the present. That would be a review of this meeting. I actually what I would be excited by is to talk to you about what I think might be the future. Now, it's always dangerous to predict what the future is, and I could be wrong, but there is a path opening up in cancer research that I want to share with you, and we've played a, a role that has brought us right into the P53 gene and its protein, uh, and that path is in a, a very exciting area of cancer research therapy today, and that's immunotherapy. Uh, what immunotherapy is is simply that we arm the immune system, our own immune system, which sees foreign substances. We arm it so that it turns on the cancer and kills the cancer. Right. And that actually works. <laughs> That's the amazing thing. Uh, it really, uh, in 19, it starts really, I'll give you a little history. In 1960, in fact, I'm going to take about five or ten minutes to define some terms so that, that I, you can understand a little bit, anyhow, the non-technical people, a little bit about where I'm going with this research. So uh, uh, in 1961, a really terrific gentleman who was the director of Memorial Sloan Kettering, Lewis Thomas, uh, was in fact, uh, wrote a paper. I, 1961 is a first year graduate student, actually. And, and I read this paper, and what he said was, I'm a pathologist, and I can look at a slide. We all looked at slides of cancers here today, today, yesterday, and the day before. I can look at these slides, and I can tell you these are abnormal cells, and I can call them cancer cells. And if that's the case, something makes them abnormal, I'm going to bet it's mutations, which was very insightful on his part. And these mutations in the cancer cell change its properties, change its look. And that's how the pathologist could see it. So if that's true, the cancer cell will be foreign to the body, just as influenza is foreign to the body when it infects you as an infectious disease. So he said, I bet the cancers are taken care of by the immune system and killed, because the role of the immune system is to recognize foreign substances and to recognize self and not attack self but to attack the foreign substances, right? So here we have a situation where someone's predicting the immune system should work. And he even went farther. He said a very interesting hypothesis. He said, while you're young, your immune system works really, really well. And so it takes care of any cancers that arise. And as you get older, it declines. And the frequency of cancer in the general population not talking about inherited cancers, but in the general population increases as you get older, and therefore they're just reciprocal curves of each other. And he had me convinced, I have to say, right? And ensued almost 40 years of research, <laughs> which went nowhere, <laughs> looking for substances on the surfaces of cancer cells that were far foreign antigens, that could, substances are called antigens, and the immune system should have recognized them and should have killed them, but it doesn't. And that was perplexing. 
And in fact, it was so uh, exhausting trying to prove that hypothesis that people's careers faded away being in, in immunotherapy, and others just toiled doing immunotherapy, and most people sort of left the field because it wasn't going anywhere. And then in the 1990s, a fellow named Jim Allison, who was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, of, 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 interestingly enough, uh, uh, he found a protein, a, a substance, a chemical substance made by a gene, right? Uh, you don't have to worry about names, but for the aficionados, his protein was CTLA4, right? And then other people found some other substances, and they found that the tumors were decorated with these proteins. In other words, the tumors started making these proteins, and the functions of these proteins that they made was to paralyze the immune system so it wouldn't kill the tumor, right? In other words, we, we all were looking for antigens, for substances that the immune system would kill, and then we could use them as vaccines, right? That all was great, but that wasn't the way it happened. The way it happened was there were plenty of substances on the surface of the cell that were not self, that were mutations and antigens, right? Plenty of them, but the immune system was paralyzed. So let me pause here, because that's the transition time into immunotherapy. I'll come back to it for my own talk. But I want to tell you what the immune system is doing when I say killing and self and non-self and so forth. The immune system is here in us. In fact, the immune system is in every living organism. Every living organism has an immune system. Even bacteria have an immune system because there are bacterial viruses that come in to kill the bacteria. And, and the name of the immune system in the bacteria is called CRISPR-Cas9, right? And what it does is the bacteria, the virus comes into the bacteria, it goes inside the cell, and the, the immune system recognizes it by making a copy. It's like making a Xerox copy. I'm old, so I say Xerox copy, right? Making a Xerox copy, right? And it has this copy of the virus. And what Cas9 does is it sees the copy and it kills by putting a hole in the DNA, breaking it up, and killing the virus. That's a pretty good immune system, right? It, and by having the copy that kills specifically, right, you're not killing yourself, you're killing anything that's foreign, right? So that's the immune system, and we actually have taken this out of bacteria, We're not we, me personally, but the whole field, taken it out of bacteria and used that technique to change genes into mutant genes or correct mutations and so forth in human beings, well not in human beings, but in tissue culture cells of human cells and so forth. And in animals, in mice, we make specific mutations with the CRISPR-Cas9, right? That's their immune system. Our immune system's quite different, it's very sophisticated, but I'm only gonna talk about one part of our immune system, it happens to be called the adaptive part of the immune system. It adapts to the, to the exposure of foreign organisms. So we'll use influenza as a good example of that. Could I get some water if I could? Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> so here we have, uh, uh, influenza, it is an infectious disease. You, we're all going to get on planes tomorrow and so forth, and somebody will be, thank you so much, someone will be coughing at, on the plane and so forth. It's getting to the end of the flu season, so it's lower probability, but uh, the virus will go into your lungs, right? And it'll enter cells, and uh, two things will happen, right? Uh, one is, that the virus will be <clears throat> recognized as different in some critical way, right? And processed in the cell so that it will be made into an antigen. And the antigen will be presented to the immune system. And the immune system will do two things. And the things it does is it does with the white blood cells in your, in your blood, the, the white cells in your blood. And there's two kinds of white cells that are going to be big players, or one of them especially, big players in what I talk about. Uh, they're called B cells. That's because they really are matured in the bone marrow. Or T cells, and that's because the T cells are matured in the thymus. And what B cells do when they see a foreign antigen is they, they have a receptor 
on their surface and they engage the foreign energy like a lock and a key, right? They have great specificity, right? So specificity is self and non-self, that's the first property. Specificity is the second property. They see great, with great specificity, influence, I, I managed to get some, thanks. <laughs> I just have to be strong enough to open it. <laughs> it's the end of the day. <laughs> mm. So the B cells have engaged the antigen, and then they make antibodies. Actually, starting with the first talk, David Lane showed a lot of antibodies made, right? This, his was made by rabbits and by other things, but we make antibodies, and those antibodies will combine with the virus in solution and prevent it from ever getting back into a cell. And so that's how a vaccine works, that's how lots of things work. It prevent, the antigen antibody complex prevents the virus from getting back in. But the T cells do something quite different. They recognize antigens presented on the cell surface of the cell. They recognize it by this, uh, another receptor that sees it like a lock and key, but they go and touch the cell that's infected with influenza virus. They touch that cell and they kill it. So your immune system is smart. The adaptive immune system does two things. The B cells neutralize both antibodies, the virus, so that it can infect more cells. But the infected cells already are killed by your immune system, by the killer T cells, which see the foreign antigen, the influenza antigen on the surface, they bind to it, and they kill the cell. Those are called killer T cells, right? And between the killer T cells and the B cells, you clear the infection. Unfortunately, none of that actually happens for about a week until it, so with the infection, and that's why you get the flu. And also, the flu is very smart, it mutates, and it's not, it's not the same as it used to be. And so that's the third part of the immune system. Remember, first part it, of the immune system right, uh, has self and non-self. Second part has real specificity, and it also has great diversity. It sees many viruses, right? Real specificity. And the third part is memory. It remembers when it saw the virus in the past. That's why vaccines work, because you have memory. You have an infection in the past, you don't usually get it again. Right? And these foreign antigens are on everything, bacteria, viruses, uh, worms, anything, anything that infects you. And the whole purpose of the immune system, right, with its B cells and its T cells, killers, right, is to protect you against infectious disease. As far as we know, it wasn't, it didn't evolve to protect us against cancer, right? And cancer got very smart, right, by uh, uh, being self, right? <laughs> In other words, the reason why Lou Thomas got it wrong was really quite interesting. He got it wrong because the tumor arises. It would normally be killed by the immune system because it is not self anymore. It is different, right? But it pretends itself by putting on these molecules on the surface that prevent the T cells from killing the tumor, right? That, those are the molecules that help us call self, right? So the tumor has found a way to be called self, even though it's not, right? It's really quite amazing how tumors actually are very, very clever in this way to avoid the immune system. Okay, so now you've actually taken a course in immunology, right? Uh, I used to teach a course in immunology with 36 one-hour lectures. Uh, you've got condensed it. You'll get degrees at the end of this. Every, <laughs> David? <laughs> University of Toronto or Princeton University? Which would you prefer? <laughs> at least it's not Boston. Don't be threatened. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, how did Jim Allison figure all this out? Right? I just brought you up to 1998 or, or 1997 when Jim Allison said, ah, oh, these pretenders on the surface of the tumor cells, these, these proteins which are protecting the tumor cell from the T cell, killer T cells coming in and killing them, right? <laughs> He's, how do we get rid of those? And he said, oh, I know how to get rid of them. I'm gonna make an antibody against them 
anti-CTLA-4, anti-PD-1. These are the tolerizing <laughs> substances on the surface of a tumor cell that protect it against T cells. I'm going to make an antibody against them. It's going to bind specifically to them, inactivate their function, and the T cells will kill the tumor cell. All right? And, and he did that in mice, and it worked. And then he did it in humans. And the humans they did it with first were people who had metastatic melanoma. Now, metastatic melanoma is uh, and was, I could really now say really was, a death sentence. Right? It meant that you had melanomas all over your body. Uh, they were pretty resistant to chemotherapy. They were pretty resistant to any therapy that we had. Right? But they had lots of mutations in them. And these mutations had lots of antigens on the surface of the cells because they would farm. And they were protected by CTLA-4 and PD-1. And if you make antibodies against them, they're no longer protected. And then some of the tumors shrunk. Right? And uh, they had responses of tumor shrinking about 40% of, of people, 50% of people responded in the short term by having all of their tumors shrink away. And then over a period of years, so that we're now out 10, 12 years, right? 20% of people are still alive today that had metastatic melanoma, right? 10 years is a cure, right? That's immunotherapy. It has a lot of problems, right? First of all, it has some side effects. You could even predict the side effects with what you know. If the antibodies that are being used to uncover self from the tumor, are to proteins that also are protecting my colon from being called non-self, right? Then I could get colitis, and colitis is a side effect, right? Or I could get actually diabetes, and type two diabetes is a side effect. Oh, type one diabetes it is already. It's the it's the immune destruction of the beta cells that make insulin, right? Well. The, the docs already know how to treat these things. They use a little cortisone to get the immune system down. They use it back to get the tumors down. And they, they get themselves 20% long-term survivors. Right? And this works for 10 or 12 different tissues now. Right? And it's, it's called immunotherapy. And it, it is what a race to the finish with three or four pharmaceutical companies to expand that number from 20% to 100%. And let's find out why it's only 20%. Let's, let's move on, right? OK, so uh, we, we made an attempt to try to help out in, in this particular area. And we wanted to do two things, right? Uh, when 100 patients come in with metastatic melanoma, and they're given an antibody against PD-1 or CTLA-4, and so they're going to go into immunotherapy, right? Uh, we don't know which 20 are going to be long-term survivors or which 40 of that 100 are going to be even responders, and which 60 are going to be non-responders. Not going to work for 60%, right? So we decided we, we were going to be clever enough to figure out how to pick responders and non-responders based on some properties they had, right? Some, some things that we thought were important in picking responders and non-responders, we would make a computer algorithm that would include all those properties, and we would be able to pick out who's a responder and a non-responder. right? And furthermore, we had to know for that exercise what the antigen was that was important in the T cell seeing the antigen on the tumor. right? Because, and, you know, many, many tumors have hundreds of mutations. Which ones are the ones that the T cells are coming in and killing with, right? And we had to know that, and we wanted the algorithm to tell us that, right? So I'm going to tell you the story about how we got there, how we did, got the algorithm, how we tested the algorithm. It worked. It works about 85% of the time. It's not perfect. In fact, it's, 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 we know it's shortcomings, and we're trying to make it better, right? And then we turned our attention to a second project that I'm going to tell you about, which quite surprisingly got us back to my love, P53, right? right? That one of the antigens on a pancreatic cancer was P53. 
was a mutation in the P53 gene, right? And the T cell saw it, and the T cell killed it. And we, got, we looked at long-term survivors of pancreatic cancer. So we'll talk about that as well. All right, so here's, I, believe it or not, I have done nothing but give you an introduction so far. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, wanna, you wanna postpone dinner? <laughs> you can't, okay. <laughs> I'm competing with the jazz band, I think. <laughs> Okay, so this is just a list of things we knew going into our experiments, right? Uh, the frequency of mutations in a tumor were an important variable. In other words, tumors that usually had more than 100 mutations did better than tumors that actually didn't have 100 mutations. And in fact, if you had a genetic disease that didn't repair DNA and you had many more mutations, you did even better. Instead of 20% of people responding, 50% of people responded, right? So mutations are meaningful here. That's what that means, right? right? In fact, there was just a very nice paper by Elizabeth Jaffe uh, that said that it, that's about 50% important. It's not, it couldn't solve the problem, but it's, it's important. Uh, secondly, the prevalence of CD8 cells in the tumor. CD8 cells are the killer T cells. You, of course you have to have the, the killer T cells in the tumor. And you could test that because when you take a biopsy and confirm the tumor, you take a section, and you could stain for CD8 cells and ask, are they there? Are they, are they in the tumor? So that's pretty important. You can't kill a tumor without the T cells coming in and, and killing it, right? So that's pretty important, right? <laughs> And, and, and there's a sudden thing called the clonality index, which is a little technical. Remember I said there's a receptor on these cells that sees the antigen, right? Well, we can do the DNA sequence of the receptor, right? And so there's, there's millions, there's, there's, there's uh, f hundreds of millions of, of, of CD8 cells in your body, right? And everyone has a different receptor. And we can sequence them, and we can tell if one of them has expanded in their clones and is replicating, which gives rise to memory, and killing the tumor. Just that way, just by looking at the number of DNA sequences that are in the tumor that are T cell sequences, right? Now, HLA, so uh, when I say an antigen and antibody come together, an antigen and a receptor, T cell receptor come together, the antigen is actually presented by another protein. So it's as if there's a chaperone, a third protein chaperone here, and that protein is called HLA, HLB, HLAB, HLAA, HLAB, or HLAC, right? And everyone's got it in this room is different HLAs, right? That was what makes us really terrific individuals, right? But, but if you don't get presented by that, if, you, if you're an antigen that doesn't fit in that part of the equation, you don't get an immune response, even if you have a T cell receptor, right? So it's not only having a T cell receptor that's important, it's having the right HLA, A, B, or C gene, right? And they come in such diverse flavors that the population is very mixed, right? But we can measure that, we can sequence the DNA and measure it as well. So an HLA class one receptor, as it's called, determines very much whether this is going to work or not. Clonal heterogeneity of the tumor <laughs> determines it. Um, it'd be better if the antigen was the very first mutation to start the tumor. Why? Because then it would be in every tumor cell. It's the first one. Because the tumor divided into 2, 4, 8, 16, right? And as it divides, new mutations come up. But they're not in all the tumor cells, the new mutations. They're in one of the cells. And then they grow. Right? So the clonality of the tumor and its heterogeneity is important. Otherwise, you'd kill half the tumor but not the other half, right? So we have to have something to look at clonality. And then I told you that the whole purpose of the adaptive immune response and these killer T cells was to take care of infectious diseases. And one of the things we all know, as long as we're not born with a tumor, right, is that we get, we get colonized by bacteria, by viruses, exposures, right? And so we all have histories of what's called the microbiome. The whole microbiological world comes and lives with us. Some people say there are as many microbes in you as there are cells that are you, right? 
And if that's true, it's a real question of who the host is and who the organism parasite is, right? <laughs> If you vote by counts, right? If here we're in a democracy, you vote by the counts, you don't know who's the host and who's the microorganism, right? Who's the organism? All right, so that's, that's number one. And this is our little algorithm. I'm just going to go through what each of the points are just to tell you. You've heard the words now, so I can go fast, right? Fitness or clonality, that's F, right? Uh, then we have two terms, one called A and one called R. R is for the microbiome. Uh, we have a list of 600 organisms and 6,000 antigens that come from the bacteria that live with you, the viruses that live with you, all these things. And those are antigens which you might have been exposed to and ought to be the training ground for the immune system to turn around, find the same antigens or similar antigens related antigens on the tumor. So that's called the microbiome, that's R. And the specificity and the, the, the affinity of, of the receptor for the antigen, that affinity is given in the term A, right? So for the, the scientists, they'll pick it up right away. It's the dissociation constant of wild type over the dissociation constant of the mutant. Mutant is going to be a p53 gene eventually, right? It's the dissociation constant. Notice that the mutant, a high ratio is terrific. Why? The, the, a lower number is a higher binding constant, right? It means the lower the constant, it's a dissociation constant. The lower the concentration that binds, right? If the mutant binds better than the wild type, the wild type is self. The mutant is the foreign substance on the tumor. Right? So if you have a ratio of 10 or better, you're in great shape. Right? So we can figure that out just by the ra that ratio. All right, we're going to start to move fast. This is, an exp this is actually a clinical trial. It was published in Science in 2014. 2014. It's by Van Allen and, and, and colleagues. This is a CTLA-4 clinical trial. You can see it's CTLA-4, right? And it's a melanoma trial, right? And so we want to just test whether the algorithm can pick out uh, responders from non-responders, right? That's the first test of the algorithm. Remember, this, we did this a hundred times before we got the algorithm right, so I'm just going to show you the one we got right. right? Okay? <laughs> so, but but, but uh, <laughs> we're plotting here different kinds of models that we have, and the log rank score, right? The higher the log rank score, the better off we are. So blue is our full model. That means all of the components, the A component, the R component, and the fitness component, right? Ignore subclonality, ignore the, the F, the, the fitness component, ignore the fact that there are, you're better off if you're homogeneous than if you're heterogeneous problem, and you get the light blue and it falls below the significance value of four, right? Ignore the microbiome. Forget about using the, the, the R term, right? And then that's the white. Right? Ignore the, the binding constant, right? That's the yellow. And ignore the load of antigen, right? The, the load of antigen is the, the, the amount of mutations, and that's the red. Or the, use the red only, right? And you get a very poor log rank score. So this is the kind of evidence, we did this with three different clinical trials. This is the kind of evidence that starts to validate the algorithm Works about 85% of the time, it's not perfect, but this, I'm going to quickly validate the, the, this way. Right. And now I want to switch to how we got to P53. So once we had an algorithm, we wanted to use it in an interesting place. An interesting place would be uh, to make a hypothesis. The hypothesis is that, that some people get cancer, they get treatments of their cancers, and then they survive forever after that. They live a full life. It never comes back. They really have a cure, right? Well, what's managing that cure? We said, oh, I know what's managing the cure. It's the immune response. It's the killer T cells. It never comes back because your immune system's with you all the time, and it sees that tumor. Forget about CTLA-4 antibodies or PD-1 antibodies. Forget about the experiment we just did. This is a normal, these people have never seen stimulators of the immune response, right? 
These are just people that had pancreatic cancer. Right now, this is survival rates for pancreatic cancer in 81 to 90, 91 to 2000, 2001 to 2010. You can see the disasters by 60 months. They're, they're down around 3 to 7 percent survival rates. Right? So we managed to collect, we, first time around, seven long term survivors. We define long term survivors. I think maybe I even have a slide for that. We define long-term survivors, here they are, here as there are 82 long-term survivors, right? And that's how long they've been living, and then there's very short-term survivors that lived only 0.88 years, right? So I'm gonna, oh, good, okay, let me go back. Okay. So we, we define these long-term survivors as people who have lived at least five years, right? That's a sort of classic medical thing, five years, right? but much longer if we can get it. And we got originally seven people who donated blood and we had their tumors and we had all the things we needed to sequence everything, find the antigens, find, find the T cells, the, sequence the T cell receptors, right? So we knew what the T cell receptors were and everything of these seven people. And then we started by asking a simple question, right? If we took the blood of someone, I'll, I'll just give you one example. This is a woman who is uh, alive 10.5 years after she's diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. 10.5 years. She generously donated blood. We took her blood. We sequenced the T cell receptors, so we knew what receptors were. You know, she has thousands of different T cells in her blood, thousands, millions, right? Uh, and we sequenced the distribution of T cells. And then we sequenced the T cells in her original tumor 10.5 years before, right? And we're going to compare whether or not some of them are the same, right? And we know the antigen because the, the clonality index gives us the antigen. So we stimulate those T cells just in a Petri dish. We stimulate the T cells right, by giving back the antigen that we think is important, right? And it responds by growing over the next 21 days. And we count the number of T cells just by the amount of DNA that's increased of that receptor of that T cell, right? So we're looking T cell by T cell by T cell in her blood. Okay, now we're ready for big time but ready for the big time experiments. All right, so you can see clone frequency at day zero, right? and clone frequency at day 21. So this is our experiment, right? We have her blood, this is just blood, this is her blood. Right, right now, for the time being, we'll get to add everything in. But we have her blood, right? And we have sequenced every one of the T cells. So each circle, be they blue or be they uh, brown, each circle's a different T cell sequence, right? And we know its concentration, this is its concentration, right? As a, it's a, per, as a percent of total, right? And, and you can see that its concentration is uh, increasing here. Right? And then at the same thing for the clone frequency at day 21. And the brown ones are the clonal frequencies, right? Clonal frequencies at day zero. That's, we haven't done any stimulation at all. So you can see their distribution is actually, uh, their concentrations are over a range of about uh, 100,000, right? Almost a million fold. Different concentrations of these T cells with different receptors. And then we stimulate with the antigen, and we get the blues, right? So some of those browns have moved up. If they move up, they increase in concentration, right? They become almost 10% of the population, 10 to the minus one, right? right? And you can see them move up. So everybody who's moved up is responding to our antigen, right? That's pretty good. And now we look at the next thing, right? We look at the microbiome that cross-reacted. You know, remember we had a component of the microbiome, so we had something that was from a, a bacteria, right, or a virus, that cross-reacted with her antigen, that looked like the antigen, very closely related, and it stimulated the red, right? So now you see some of the blue and some of the red are together, right? All the way up there, right? So we got, we got the microbiome ref here, confirmed, and we got, we, we got there, this is 10.5 years afterwards, right? After what's, what the antigen is, right? And now we look in the tumor, 
right? This is the killer, right? And now, everywhere you see one of these arrows, TILS, T-I-L stands for the tumor and initiating lymphocyte. These are the lymphocytes that were in the tumor. The tumor had lots of, in fact, the top clone was 6.2% of all the T cells we found in the tumor, right? So this was the real validation that this woman had T cells in her tumor originally that we sequenced, had T cells 10.5 years later where the antigen that was in the tumor has now expanded, right? right? And it cross-reacts with the microbiome. And those are the three components of our algorithm, right? Not bad, right? So we, we did this as, with as many people as we had all the information for. Here you can look at the diversity. They're, they're very different from each other, but they're all long-term survivors, right? And for the sake of getting back to what this conference is all about, patient number one, sitting in the corner there, in the left upper corner, patient number one, she's 11.5 years out, right? Her top antigen is P53, right? So for the aficionados, it's E271K, right? It's glutamine to lysine change at codon 271, right? Right in the DNA binding domain where most of these are. It's a missense mutation. It's processed by her HLA type. It, someone else with 271, by the way, that had a different HLA type would never have had that response. That's why I say, that's why I said during the <laughs> during the, the sessions, hey, maybe it's not only the mutation, maybe there's a second gene, the HLA gene, that has to match up, right? And our algorithm tells us which, what, what matches up, okay? Now, once we saw that, I got pretty interested <laughs> in what was going on, and once we saw that, we said, hey, we know all of the P53 mutations, there's databases all over the place, right? There's five, six databases. We could just line up all the P53 mutations, take an HLA type that's very common. There are some HLA A types that are 40% of the Caucasian population. Uh, by the way, it's sort of interesting side effect right away. These, this immediately makes some predictions which we're trying to test. One of them is uh, HLA types differ pretty dramatically between Caucasians, Asians, and uh, Africans. Right? And we would predict, therefore, that the hotspot, what you'll see in a minute, that the, that the mutations that are responding to the immune response would be different in those racial groups. Right? Or the HLA types within the Caucasians would make them different. Right? OK, so let's, let's start to take a look at, at that issue. Right? So this is the, there's a, a database called COSMIC. It's about 7,000 uh, 7, P53 mutations. And they, uh, you can measure their frequency. So you can see some mutations in cosmic are this, this one at 7.5% is the one you've been hearing about all the time. Uh, it's 175H. It's R175H. It's the most common mutation in humans. Uh, and it's, remember, everybody's mouse experiment. It, the mouse equivalent is 172, R172H, right? So all the mice we heard about, here it is, right? And that's the ratio, right, of the KDs, of the wild type. So remember I told you you had to have something better than 10 to be immunologically good. Well, we've got some antigens there that are at 1,000 and 2,000, right? Ratios of, of, of mutant and wild type, they're going to be terrific, right? But they're very rare. <laughs> this, is, this is an inverse relationship between the frequency and the immunological activity. So it makes the hypothesis immediately that the reason there are hotspot mutations in cancers of P53 is they're not being recognized by the immune response. And therefore, they're going to take off. Right? And the other ones are very rare. They're the ones higher than 10 over way below 1% right? that are recognized. Right? So we estimate from this that about 20% of P53 mutations will be immunogenic. But remember, this is a theoretical HLA type. This is the HLA type for 40% of the population. You still have to make matches and so forth. So we don't really know the numbers. But hey, we're not doing too badly if we could get 
really get 20 to 30 percent of the cancers with p53 mutations and immunize and get the T cells working and use checkpoint therapies and it's a path that just opens up. That's why I say the future, right? Okay, so uh, this is all great, and it all depends on if, you know five people that we have for <laughs> one cancer and so forth and so on. So it's it, it's a little early days, right? But we started to use data that's in the literature to test our ideas. Okay, so let me just take you through a couple of tests of our ideas. Okay, so uh, this is this is a a, a another trial that went on in Memorial Sloan Kettering, right? And this trial is pretty interesting uh, because uh, it w this is lung cancer, and lung cancer responds to uh, PD this is PD-1 uh, antibody, right? And about 20% of people are responders and so forth and so on, right? And we know that there is signaling all over the place that lung cancer has P53 mutations, right? That's pretty common, right? And so we divide the, the P53 mutations from this lung cancer. We, I keep moving back, I'm sorry. We divide the, I'm up into three groups. So watch the three groups. Blue is the immunogenic group, it's 13 examples. Uh, the, the yellow is the non-immunogenic group, but those are both mutants, right? And then there's the wild type, right? And this is the, the fraction survival versus months Right? So it's, it, it's a Kat Meyer, Kaplan-Meyer plot, right? And look, the longest living ones are immunogenic P53. The next ones are, uh, and that's statistically significant, 0.0395, right? And, and the, actually the worst ones are the P53 wild type. <laughs> now, <laughs> some lessons here, isn't there? <laughs> Uh, this, by the way, had been seen before, that P53 wild type was supposed to be the terrific savior for all the chemotherapy and things like that, and all the that kinds of therapies. And, and, you know, there was even a wonderful hypothesis that explained everything and didn't work. And it didn't work because, it, in fact, the, uh, it's really quite amazing in breast cancer, the wild type P53 breast cancer type, ER positive, for example, right, doesn't respond to chemotherapy very well. And the one that responds to chemotherapy very well has mutant P53, right? But it's probably responding to more than chemotherapy. It's probably chemotherapy followed by immunolo immunological attack on the tumor, right? <laughs> so it's really quite an interesting, it just opens up hypothesis this comes out of the data, out of the literature, right? Now, we just did the same thing with glioblastoma, right? This is glioblastoma. Glioblastoma, I didn't think was going to have a very strong immune response. It's in the central nervous system. It's not been reported to have a really good, strong immune response. But the results are pretty much the same. If 15 immunogenic ones, 29 non-immunogenic ones, and the green are wild type, right? The green survivals, again, wild type is going down faster than the other two, and the immunogenic is better than the non-immunogenic, right? Not perfect, because we're probably not calling who's immunogenic and non-immunogenic really well, right? Okay, now let, just something we just heard at this meeting. This meeting solidified something, I think, you know, if you want to give credit for meetings, this, this is what this meeting, one of the things this meeting did, right? We have like four papers on this topic, and they all agree, so we believe it, right? So uh, when you look in the literature, I'm just going to give you literature numbers. Everybody will dispute these numbers a little bit. When you look in the literature at, at the frequency with which you find Lee Fraumini individuals, probands for families, not the numbers in families, but the individuals, right? Some people say it's about 1 in 20,000 in the population. Other, other papers say it's one in 5,000 in the population. All right? So there's somewhere of a fourfold range of what Lee Fraumini individuals are in the population, one in 4,000, one in 5,000, one in 20,000, right? And then people asked, is, that, is Lee Fraumini equal to P53 mutations? Right? And what we heard here is if you look at for the frequency of P53 mutations in the general population, not in the population that comes in because there's cancer in the family, right? But the population in general, because there's no cancer, right? Just sequence, population. 
We heard the varying numbers here, one in 500, to one in 1,500, to one in 2,000. There's a discrepancy between people carrying Lee Fraumini mutations, right? Uh, sorry, P53 mutations, and those reporting high incidence of cancer, right? And we even saw some families where there was some parts of the families no cancer at all, and other parts of the families there was cancer, right? So that's why I kept saying, hey, there's a hypothesis here, right? Why would there be fivefold or tenfold or a hundredfold more people carrying a mutation without the phenotype than with the phenotype that we thought was associated with the gene, right? Well, if they matched immunologically, they could be under control immunologically, right? It's a hypothesis, that's what it is, right? But it's testable. That's what's so great about this. Testable hypothesis could be falsified, right? In other words, we could get 100 people or 1,000 people carrying P53 mutation who don't report can cancer very high in the family, right? And match their HLA type and see if it's going to be immunological sound, right? And then there's suddenly a path for everybody that does have cancer in the family if we can start to get the immune response to work. Right? So uh, what's great about the hypothesis is it has testable ideas. And I said when I said, what I want to do is talk about the future. This is the future. It's not the present. Right? But it's good to hear optimistic futures. It's good to think optimistically about the future. And you could be assured that not only my lab and the people who have been associated with this work will continue to work in this vein, but you'll be assured, and that's why I gave the talk, that the scientists here will start to move into the area and test the hypothesis, right? So uh, let me just give credit where credit is due. This is a team effort. You, it's, you saw clinical trials. You saw computer sciences. You saw algorithms put together by you know, deep learning uh, experiment, experiments. Really neat stuff, right? And it took, it took an awful lot of people from many different places, right? And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and a postdoc of mine, Marta Luska, uh, who is, uh, really uh, did all of the algorithm work. She's a, trained as a computer scientist who's come into biology and who's really done an absolutely fantastic uh, job. So lots of people have contributed uh, to this work. And, and uh, a chunk of this work actually is actually published in Nature uh, over the last month, December 2017. So thank you very, very much. David will be granting degrees tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Arnie, as usual, thanks uh, for a fantastic uh, exploration into the future, and and uh, and hopefully at the next meeting we'll be uh, seeing some of this uh, in reality of some sort. Are there? We do have a at this point. Questions? Yes, David. David. David was trained as an immunologist, so he's dangerous. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Um, <laughs> so. I, a great, fantastic story, but I, I, I concern that when people have a germline uh, mutation, yes. they'll be tolerant of that yes. because it's self. Yes. So you won't see quite this effect in that in that situation. Yeah. So th th they, this is a good point. Uh, um, remember, I said the immune system sees all of the proteins you have as self, and it goes through a very extensive process before birth, even, of sorting out what's self and what's non-self, right? And um, it would mean that you, and that's called tolerance. You tolerate yourself and you go after the foreign substances, right? Um, one possibility is to break tolerance specifically. You, you can break tolerance, and you can break it specifically to an antigen. Uh, and that would be one path. Uh, these are hypothetical paths right now. I'm answering David's question. Uh, another possibility is that this, the numbers, that's why I gave the numbers, that there are some thousands of people out there with P53 mutations which are self because they were inherit them, right? The germline mutations. And yet the immune system might be working on them, right? 
I don't know. That's a hypothesis. It's a guess. Could it be lots of other things, right? But, but all of these things uh, suggest that it's testable path. It, we would, what we would do with these... So this is an interesting problem. I asked the genetic counselors this. That's why I was so happy to have genetic counselors here. Right? Uh, here's a problem, right? Uh, we, we have 40,000 people in New York City that are being sequenced. They're very diverse. They're very interesting. We expect, based on this one in a thousand, right, 40 of these people are going to come up with P53 mutations. The IRB has given us the right to contact them again, right? And neither the genetic counselors want to do this, right, contact them again, because they don't know what to say to these people, because... So far, they haven't had excessive cancers, right? And, they, and, and so they're stuck. And then there's the cost of all this, right? Calling in 40 people and counseling them but not knowing what to say and, how to, and do you have to continue watching over them and so forth and so on. So you can see that uh, immediately there's a medical set of questions here which are completely out of my hands, of course, but, but I, I, that's why I'm talking to genetic counselors and trying to figure out what, what's the best to do. There may be some, some other ways to get hints and things. I'll, I'll give you an example of an experiment we're just doing, in fact, right? So th this experiment is a perfect example of what to say to people, right? Remember, we've got now seven, we've got five, and we have another 20 that, that, you know, we advertised on Facebook, and we got hundreds of people that said they were long-term survivors of pancreatic cancer. I don't know that they are, but it's quite amazing that you can recruit on Facebook that way. I mean, it's, it's not only the Russians who recruit on Facebook. <laughs> Anyhow, the... the um, so the, we're watching these people who have, who have been 11, 12 years out of pan, with free of cancer, with pancreatic cancer. Some of them relapse, then they get the tumor again, right? The tumor is biopsied, so we can tell immediately that it would have the same mutation of p53, right? And then, and then we can ask the question, did the clones, the T cell clones, disappear? That's one possibility. Has PD-1 come back? And it's no longer the tumors are being hidden from the clones, right? In other words, it is the immune response. That would be the first evidence that it is the immune response that's really taking care of it, right? And now, that, it is true that that's not an inherited uh, mutation, but, but, but it'll move us closer if that happens to somebody, for example, who carries P53, gets a, a tumor and a mutation, and then we can go back and look uh, that they've survived it and look at the T cells and things like that. Yeah. Okay, thank That's you. Really great. Okay. <laughs>